We've saved the best panel for last. Um, everybody here agree on that? Okay. So we have three great business leaders here, and you're going to learn how to make a lot of money if you listen to this panel. Okay? How many people here want to make a lot of money in the technology area? Anybody? Okay. Well, these people are going to tell you how to do this. Why don't we start with Eric? Uh, Eric, you are the chairman and CEO for a long time at Google, Alphabet now, I guess now. When you joined that company, all it really had was a search engine, and there had already been a lot of search engines. There was nothing novel about right. search. Why did you give up your career to go to this tiny little company, and did you think they had such an innovation that it was going to change the world? Um, I just simply thought that people were just too interesting and too smart to do something that w they would have some impact. And when you start with a startup, you have no idea it'll, it will wiggle, it will change. But you can tell that it has a sense of purpose and a sense of recruiting momentum and so forth. And that's why I went to Google. So today, um, after all these years as a dominant search engine, do they really have any rival in the search engine business? They dominate the business still, don't they? We never use the word dominate. dominate. They have a uh, very large share of the business, don't they? <laughs> uh, that's correct. And is that because they keep changing the algorithm, still updating it, or is it just because it was so good in the beginning nobody can catch up? Well, so there are thousands of people working on these algorithms, and now all of the Google algorithms use AI. And so uh, the core thing that Google does is it just gets better and better every year. And when you joined the company, it was very young, but it had a different culture than many cultures you would see in East Coast kind of companies. You have told me a story once when you were the CEO, you left your office one time, and then you came back, somebody was in your office, you're the yeah, CEO. This, this fellow just sort of moved in, and I said, why are you here? And he said, my office was crowded, and you were never in the office. And did you kick them out? No, because at Google, that would be a, a political foul, right? <laughs> so instead, we became best friends. He sat next to me for years. And Google traditionally was spelled a different way. Did they spell it that way on purpose, different than the way it was traditionally well, spelled? Well, Google came from the number 10 to 100. And 10 to 100 is spelled G-O-O-G-O-L. And it was hard for people to do it that way. So Sergey changed it to Google. OK. So today, um, when you look at, you are doing many things today, but among the things you're doing is you do invest in technology companies and run it around the world. What do you look for when you're looking for an innovator? When you're looking for somebody who's saying, I need some money, um, I'm going to be the next uh, Google uh, founder. When, when you hear that pitch, you probably roll your eyes, but what is it you're looking for when you, you back somebody in a, in a young company? The greatest companies have two components. They have a technical platform and they have a new business approach. Right, both of these guys have done the same, this in, in, their, in China and so forth. So, so we know this is be true. Just having phenomenal technology is not enough. You have to have a phenomenal technology, some new invention that people are going to depend on, but you have to have a new way of selling, a new way of making money. So when you look at new companies, have you ever made a mistake and you didn't back somebody you should have backed? Did oh, that ever all happen? the time. And what do you look back at the mistake you made? You just didn't realize the person was dedicated enough or smart enough? Or? Well, for me personally, I'm, I'm pretty good at figuring out what the platform looks like. I'm very di it's hard to see what the use of the platform is. So what happens in our industry is there's new platforms every two, three, five years. So the next platform, by the way, is going to be an AI-based platform. Okay. It's very hard to pick among the uses of the platforms to which ones will dominate. Okay. So in your career, um, you started at uh, Goldman Sachs. And you were, rose up, you were a uh, managing director. What could be a higher calling of mankind than to be a managing director of Goldman, right? <laughs> so why did you leave Goldman to go to a uh, taxi cab hailing company? Why did you do that? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, when I first moved back to Beijing, I simply couldn't hail a taxi when i on the street with my three kids. Right, and I always want to join something exciting and build something. So when I met with the founder of DD, when it was a tiny company, I see the potential, and I also love the team there. So I just All right. In. So your father is a technology star. He started Lenovo. So did he say to you, stay at Goldman Sachs, or did he say go to a startup company? Well, he just said. Actually, I asked uh, advice from different people. Asked for Martin's advice as well. And people warned me saying, you know, like my Xbox from Goldman said, are you sure you're going to join a taxi company? Um, and you need to be prepared that it's a grassroots company and the culture is very hardcore and you want to make sure you can survive there. And a lot of people bet I couldn't survive and I still feel I'm surviving, but you know. 
And um, your service uh, was competing for a while with Uber in China, and then you ultimately, in effect, bought Uber in China, right? So how did you convince Uber that you were better than they were? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, well, first of all, very sincerely, we really thank competition. Without Uber, we wouldn't be able to play the World League game. We were a national league, right? Uber came when we were three years old, and the war test, the money they brought in was bigger than our market cap. So we were scared for a moment, and there was a big decision whether we give in or not, right? And all the senior executive, I, the 25-year-old, gathered together every morning, 9 a.m. in the meeting room, you know, inspired by some inspirational songs and <laughs> trying to figure out the tactics. So, you know, I think a few things. Uh, first of all, we worked really hard. You know, the product team stay in the office, you know, for three months. They sleep in the office, and we roll out four product lines after Uber came in. Uh, and secondly, we think we understand the market more, right? We, like you said, not just technology, but also understanding of the market, understanding what the people really here need. Okay. So we, we do a different approach. And when you joined the company, the market capitalization was roughly $500 million. Um, what's it today? Well, I don't can't want to say. <laughs> can't say. It's worth yeah. more. Yeah, I can't say. But if yeah. somebody wanted to invest at $500 million today, would you take their money or? Not so much. Well, we will talk about you know, strategic operations. Now, if, if you are, want to find out how your company's doing, you can look at statistics, but you actually go out and drive the car yourself sometimes as a, as yes. a driver. So what is the most frequent comment you get when you're the driver? They say you're a good driver? Or? Yeah, actually, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a poor driver, by the way. Um, Actually, you know, the other day I went on the street with my colleague who tries to protect me if I, you know, run into something. And, you know, there's a young guy, a sophomore, coming on the, uh, jumping in the car, and my, my colleague told him, this is the president of DD, and we want to survey you for some question. And the guy just shrugged, shrugged and said, whatever. Um, if you are doing a survey, can I get some coupon instead? Uh, <laughs> Um, so, you know, this is the young generation of China, they're rebels at heart. They actually, you know, they, they don't give, you know, okay. whoever you are, so. So, Martin, you also were at Goldman Sachs, so is there something in the blood or water there? What is it about Goldman Sachs that produces great entrepreneurs in China? <laughs> well, we got good people. Good people, yeah, all right. And was she maybe. working for you at one point, or? Yeah, she was an intern. She was uh, an intern. Yeah, for was me, right? For yeah, an intern. yeah, for <laughs> for a while, and then and then I left, and then okay. she. Right. I didn't make managing director. You didn't. She made it. Right? Oh, really? So I left when I was. Uh, director, okay. So. so do you still think about the fact you didn't make managing director? You ever thought how your life would be better <laughs> had you made managing director? No. You don't think about it too much. Okay. So on ten cent, the market cap is about four hundred billion dollars or so, something yes. like that. So uh, today. Um, you are competing with other technology companies that are often based in China, like Alibaba or Baidu. Why do you think that the great technology companies in China have not yet penetrated, let's say, the United States? Why is that? Well, I think there are a lot of discussion this morning which give you some hints of that. But I think you know, for, for, the, for a long time, right, you know, Chinese tech companies uh, have a large market to address in China. right? You know, and and as a result, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time basically sort of penetrating China. And I'll give you an example. You know, it's very difficult for us to even you know, find managers uh, who want to unroot from China and say, you know, I, want, I moved to the US and then develop the US market. Uh, that's one. And, and two is I think the cultural difference is actually quite different. Right? You know, for products that are very popular in China, you may not get far in, in the States. Okay. Now, your company has done a lot in video games. Yep, right? that's one of our business. One of your business. Do you think video games are really healthy for young people? They spend too much time on video games, and <laughs> do you have young children, you want them to spend a lot of time on video games? Or? Well, I think you know, video games are, are good uh, when it's used in moderation. Right? You know, I, I remember you know, I, I uh, studied engineering because I got my first Apple IIe, and play video games on it, right? Yeah, I was like fascinated by the video games. So I think, you know, like anything else in the world, if you do it in moderation, <laughs> it's good, right? It trains your reaction time, it trains your strategy, it, you know, it, it, it puts you in teams that you work with people, right? Just like sports. Oh. Now, I don't think you, you should play a lot of video games, especially when you are young 
kids, right, Neil? So that's why we okay. actually put together a, a, a system which limits the amount of uh, gameplay by well, minors. How do you, like, what about people who work in your company during the daytime, if they want to play video games, is that okay? Because <laughs> yeah, playing, they could, they they could play a video game all day long if they I want, see. right? But now, then usually they stay behind and finish the work. Now, WeChat, um, yes. did you invent that or who came up with that? WeChat is actually, well, what, what the company was founded was actually an uh, uh, instant messaging platform right. and, and social network, which is called QQ, right? That's almost like, you know, a, a precursor to WeChat. But then that's a product which is built on PC. So when the mobile age comes, right, you know, we say, you know, this is uh, advancing too slowly for mobile. This is designed for PC. This is not uh, right. designed mobile only, right? You know, so at that time, actually, you know, we said, you know, we need to have a mobile-only instant messaging platform. And within our company, three different teams actually put up their hands and say they want to do it. So we actually allowed it, all three teams to do it. Okay. Yeah. And the one team, uh, which came up with the best user experience, actually won it out. And then we back it up with all our corporate resources. And do they get a big bonus for that? It's yeah, sure, a lot of stock. And, <laughs> and, and uh, why has WeChat not taken off, let's say, in the United States? Well, that's a very good question, and I think, well, first of all, I think, you know, at, in the U.S., you know, uh, a lot of people actually use SMS, right, you know, and SMS has always been free, and from that point onward, a lot of people use iMessages because the, the iPhone penetration is actually very high. Now, the WhatsApp was actually sort of, you know, almost like the global uh, inst instant messaging, mobile instant messaging platform, and, and at the time when WhatsApp you know, was actually conquering the world. Um, I think, you know, their, their positioning is very simple, right? You know, they, it, the user experience is actually as light as possible. It's SMS replacement. And as a result, right. you know, any people around the world can be using it. Now, for us, at the time, we actually decided to go deep. We say, you know, WeChat, if we can actually make it uh, as a platform that everybody uses in China, we can actually start adding other features to it and make it a platform, right? You know, so from instant messaging, we added the social network called Moment, and then we added an official account platform which allows people to publish, and then we have payment, WeChat Pay, which become the you know, largest okay. mobile payment platform in China, and then right. with mini programs which allows people to run all sorts of different uh, uh, app-like activities. Hey, Eric, you've become an advisor to government leaders in our country on artificial intelligence, so should people be worried about artificial intelligence taking away the jobs of people who have jobs today? Or should people embrace artificial intelligence because it's going to make our life so much better? Um, I believe very strongly we should embrace artificial intelligence. The uh, artificial intelligence is not the thing that you see in the movies, you know, where the robot kills, kills the man and saves the girl uh, and that sort of thing. Artificial intelligence is going to revolutionize healthcare. So, for example, the doctor spends all this time looking at you, your skin, your eyes, what have you. That's going to be better done by computers, advising the doctor, the doctor will make the decision. All the evidence is that AI will be used in conjunction with people not to replace jobs. There are perhaps jobs which are very, very routine, which are better done by computers, but that process has been going on for a very long time. AI may accelerate that. But the other thing to say is that because of the demographic problems, right, remember we have more and more older people and fewer young productive people in terms of workforce, they're going to need to be more productive in terms of economic productivity, and they're going to use AI to do so. So if I wanted to invest in young artificial intelligence companies, should I go to China to find them, United States, Israel, where would I find the um, best one? Yes. All of those places. Uh, yes. And in fact, we, uh, we released a study a couple weeks ago about where AI was in the global uh, scene. And there are a number of countries that are leading. There's no question that the U.S. is the farthest advanced. However, China has, as a national priority, made leadership, or at least co-leading uh, in AI, an, a huge priority for their STEM-related fields. Right. They're producing many, many more uh, articles, patents, computer scientists, and so forth. There's every reason to think that China will be a leader as well. Now, you're the head of a commission that the Congress has authorized to study and Right. figure out what to do about artificial intelligence. Do members of Congress understand artificial intelligence? Uh, I, I, <laughs> since they hired us, let me just say that they could use some education. Okay, all right. And by the way, you made a very famous statement uh, maybe a couple years ago now, said that if we don't, we're not careful, we're going to have two internets, a Chinese internet and an American internet. And are you worried that that's going to happen now? I continue to worry not about the internet itself, but that the 
applications environments will begin to be diff different. If you look at here, we have these fantastic entrepreneurs that moved very quickly uh, and, and sort of came to sort of these extraordinary things in China, which are generally not available in the United States. Similarly, uh, there are many, many services in the United States that are not available in China. Eventually, that's a bad thing, right? The whole idea of the internet was global connectivity, global access, global knowledge, that collectively as human beings, we're all better off, and I continue to believe that. When the internet was invented, some people would say in the United States, some people might say France, wherever you might. No, it was the United States. Right, United States. So mm -hmm. out of, let's say, DARPA or out of uh, yeah. Pentagon the or four, The first four sites were on the West Coast. Okay, with so the, when it was developed, Boston. it was saying everybody come in and come in, share the information. And as a result of that, it's possible for people to come in and hack where they're not really welcome. Is it possible to reinvent the internet so that hacking is not possible? Um, well, today there are many, many people working on making the internet much more reliable, much more secure. The original internet, for example, uh, the DNS is the technology that does naming. The DNS servers were all open. You could just change them. You could change China to be India or vice versa because the people who were building all of this were naive professors and right. uh, academic people like me. And it would never occur to us that people would try to sort of attack this kind of infrastructure because it was so pleasant and nice. Um, and so as a result, the internet was not built in the early versions of IP with the kind of security that you would put it in if you knew it was going to become right. a global standard. That has since been added. Now, in the technology world, the Silicon Valley, which you're part of, um, nobody wears a tie. I assume you this, did this for this purpose. Um. But uh, is it, if you wear a tie, does it slow down your thinking process? Is that, the, <laughs> is that the reason people in Silicon Valley don't do it, or they don't want to take the time to put a tie on? What is your thinking I there? I think it's a cultural statement. Uh, really? California has always been different from everyone. So, like, you have colorful socks. Is that part of the <laughs> that's, culture? That's considered, same, that's, same thing. That's considered <laughs> acceptable. So uh, today, um, you're working on, and, and Google has been working on as well, uh, artificial, uh, um, not artificial, autonomous but driving. Um, automatic driving or autonomous driving, I should say. Yeah. So how long will it be before I can be behind one of your cars and not have a driver in it and feel safe? Is that no, you 10 asked years me away? that first. Well, <laughs> you should ask first, you're working on it. You spun your division off. Sure, sure. Um, and I think Google, did you spin yours off as well? Or yeah. something like that? Okay, so I guess nobody wants to have it on their balance sheet because it well, might have big yeah, risks. No, I, no, I can assure you it's on our balance sheet. <laughs> on the balance sheet, okay. The, the, the engineers will tell you it's five years, five years away. from now, but five years later, they will tell you another five years. Yeah. But are these engineers willing to go into the car? That's the question. Were they actually willing to go into the car where there's an yeah. autonomous driver? Okay. I agree are you, with your observation. Have you been in one of these cars yet? Uh, yes, yes. I sat in, in the car and, you know, I get my hand up to the holder the whole time. Uh, well, the fact that, you know, all these big companies put, you know, we're a small one, but they're a big one, put aside this means it takes a lot of commitment. And I think the fundamental drive for us to do this is we think this will make driving safer. Like you mentioned, right. I'm a pro driver, right? So, you know, our key... You know, our key mission here is really to not just technology make it mature, but also commercialize it, okay. right? So I think what takes longer will be how to commercialize it. Okay, but, but, but let me give you the numbers. Ahead. About 1.3 million people die in car accidents worldwide every year. Can you imagine how many people that is, just in terms of death? Imagine if you could cut that in half, 600,000 people would be alive. It, it, so the, the, the goal of our industry collectively is to reduce, is to increase safety and reduce death. Yeah. So you I mean, wh I mean why in the world would you how, let humans drive these cars? How long, you think it's five or 10 years away before we get well, them? It's, it's in the United States, uh, Waymo has uh, trials that are underway that have been quite successful in Arizona. Okay. So in China, you are one of the most senior women running a major company or president of the company. So is it easier than in the United States to be a woman CEO um, or harder? Well, I think, first of all, in China, it's actually quite encouraging for women to stay in the career. Um, however, it's still very hard, right? You know, you can, for men, I'm sorry, but, you know, no offense, but normally all the men can plan their career for the next 30 years, right, without pausing. But for a woman in tech or not in tech, in U.S. or in China, you always think about, you know, what happens if you get married, if you have kids, if you come back to work, do you still have your position? So there are a lot of, you know, distractions, you know, Fair or fairly or not, I think now you know it's much better than before, but it still has huge room to improve. So you're saying that men don't spend as much time on child rearing as women? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I didn't yeah. say that. You didn't well, say didn't that. Just okay. say, you know, we didn't say that. Okay. Men, men has boring <laughs> lives. Okay. So today, yeah. um, 
when you started at uh, the company, uh, you had 30 competitors in China. How many competitors do you have now? We still have a lot of competitors. I think we have one competitor to every province. And, <laughs> and you know, China is a very, very competitive field. Uh, a lot of people experience it, you know, I think everyone's trying so hard to please Chinese consumers. We have the most spoiled consumer in a good way. Right. Everyone come here and compete. Right. So. so you have a cap, when somebody's in one of your cars, you have a captive audience. So why don't you sell them advertising, sell them uh, financial services, sell them anything. Why do you not do that? Or are you in the process of selling people things when they're in your, one of your cars? Well, it's not our, uh, it's not our current focus yet. However, when 5G comes, when the experience inside of the car can be significantly improved, we think we will have better content for everyone to sit in a car. They can have a karaoke, they can watch some video from Tencent. <laughs> they launch one soap opera every week, 70 episodes all the time. So we have a lot of good content in China. However, how to make it happen in a, inside of a car it requires better technology. So far, you know, if we sell something, it's hard sell, and I don't think people will buy it so and should buy it. What about if somebody uh, wants your service and they show up, your car shows up and the person's drunk? Do you put them in the car and what do you do with the <laughs> drunk people? <laughs> you actually ask the key question, uh, right? You know, for a young company, we are seven year old, right? You know, the, the thing that keeps us awake is actually was how to understand our responsibility and how do you communicate with the community, you know, uh, communicate with the community, right? You know, for example, your, the question you ask, we got hundreds of complaints from our drivers saying they get assaulted by drunk passengers every day, huh. every day. And they complain to us and say, can we reject them, right? And originally we thought, we cannot let them let that happen because bad things will happen to them, right? So these are things we can make decision now. What we are doing is we put public consultation, we set up blog, and we seek consultation it, from people. How many drivers do you have? 30 million or so? Yeah, we have 30 million registered right. drivers. How many of those are women? Well, well we have um, 2 million drivers, female drivers. 2 million female. Yeah. And your customer base, is that 50-50 female, male, yes. or not? Yes. And is your average customer 70 years old or 30 years old? We have a diverse range because we have luxury black car. We also have bikes, right, and uh, uh, you know express cars. Uh, but majority, I, I would say 25 to 35. Are you in the electric scooter business also? or Yes. Is that safe for people, you think? Yeah, we want to make sure it's safe, yeah. We, we have helmets. Helmets? Yeah. That's still, they don't go to the hospital breaking bones. That You don't have that here. We have that in the United States, people breaking their bones on those scooters. Yes, actually, that's what we want to, you know, that's what we are working really hard on, right, to make it okay. safer. And when are you going to expand to the United States? It's very crowded. Oh, so you're not going <laughs> to? Yeah, I think we're, we will pick a market that we can create real user value, okay. right? When there's a market that need our service, then we will go, I um, think, right? I think karaoke cars. Karaoke? Okay, Chinese I don't thing. remember that. So, Martin, um, when yes. people come to you presumably all the time and say, I have the next uh, WeChat, I have the next great video game, how do you decide which ones to back? Do you have a team of people that looks at all these ideas, and how many proposals do you get for new ideas, and how many do you reject? 99% what, what, of them you reject? Yeah, we get a lot of proposals, but at the same time, I think you know, our team actually go out and reach out to these entrepreneurs, right, you know, and try to look at the product. I think, you know, Basically, you look at the product, the value proposition, the tech, and the people, right? You know, that's sort of, you know, the suite of things that you look at and eventually decide whether you want to invest or not, right? So far, I think, you know, we've probably invested in about 600 companies. Right. And when you want to get around China, do you use her service or you don't use her service? Sometimes. You do? Yeah, and yeah. And how do you rate it? Is it okay or? Oh, it's great, <laughs> it's great. Okay. Yeah. And do you use WeChat a lot? I'm on it every second. And how do you rate it? Pretty good. <laughs> very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, we, we are a very early backer of uh, DD. So that's why I, I always want to use their right. service to make sure that they are actually you know, provide a good service. So Eric, uh, you uh, are an electrical engineer, PhD in that from, from uh, Berkeley. And then you started a number of technology companies. But how would you say the technology world has changed in the United States and China uh, since you first got into the technology world? Um, when I started, which was more than 40 years ago, this was basically engineers, scientists who were sort of thought, were tinkering and inventing things that were interesting. There was no notion of marketing. There was no notion of branding. There was no money to be made. The salaries were low. And uh, in the last 20 years, that's completely changed. The industry is now immense. 
Uh, the teams are immense. The amounts of funding is immense. This is global. Um, talking about China, China the companies will have 10,000 people, 20,000 people in them. Uh, these are massive organizations. And I keep wondering, why do you need 1,000 people to do A, B, or C? And the answer is that you do, because these things have gotten so complicated. So there's a story that uh, when Google got its first money from a venture capitalist, they were supposed to go out and hire an adult to be the CEO. They didn't do it for a while, and the venture capitalist said, give us the money back. And they didn't want to give it back, so ultimately they decided to hire a CEO. You were the CEO. But uh, you ever ask uh, the founders of uh, Google, uh, whether they have considered giving the money back or <laughs> they never considered it? I don't think they ever considered it. That was before I showed up. Okay. So one of the things that Google has become famous for and other technology companies are is for a very free lifestyle. You come in, you, you feed people there so they don't leave. You take care of their laundry. You let them work all kinds of hours. Is that part of the culture and you think that produces innovation or it just makes people feel better? Well, the, the key with these workforce strategies is to have people who select in. So the kind of strategies that we use work with people who are uh, capable of working independently. They're highly motivated. They care about what they're doing. They're passionate about their work. So we select for that, right? So our approach may not work in other industries right. where you don't select for it. So when you're interviewing people to hire, when you were doing that earlier days, were you looking for people who were brilliant, hardworking, well-dressed, well-groomed? What was the thing you were um, most looking for? We certainly, the only dress code we had is that you had to wear clothes. Okay. Uh, that was a rule. But uh, <laughs> we had to actually have that rule. So, uh, <laughs> but, but the important point was, uh, we, generally we found in the tech industry it moves so quickly that you have to look for people who have a kind of intelligence that's fluid. In other words, they, not only do they see something, but they have to be able to deal with the many changes. Historically, you could find people who had done something in a previous company, but they were going to come to your company right. and do it the same way. That didn't work. Now, many technology stars um, dropped out of college or didn't get their final degree. So Bill Gates dropped out, uh, Steve Jobs dropped out, Mark Zuckerberg dropped out. Now, you've got a PhD. Do you ever think how much more successful you would have been <laughs> had you dropped out? You ever thought of that? I'm very happy I okay. stayed in the educational system. Okay. So um, in your case, uh, if you were to leave tomorrow and do something else, what would you do? And let's suppose you've already done all the great things you could do at DD. Would you, what would you do? Would you want to start your own company, be a venture investor, uh, go back to Goldman Sachs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that's an offer, but uh, I haven't really thought about this, to be very frank, right? I, I talked to my kids about if mommy retire, let's start a cake shop, and my biggest girl can play piano, and you know, my youngest one can be the chef, but that's a joke. You know, our job is so intense and challenging. If anyone in our service will understand, you know, we're okay. fully occupied to, you know, we're awake all the time, so I don't have the luxury to think about what's the next stop for to be very honest. So in your case, uh, you're very young as well. Um, have you thought about what you might do in the next stage of your life? And now that you have a fair amount of money by normal human standards, have you thought about <laughs> philanthropy and um, you know, things like that? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's, there's still a lot that we can do with uh, the, the current platform that we have. Now, moving beyond that, I actually felt that you know, there are certain things right, which you know, internet has really uh, revolutionized, but there are sectors which they have not, right? You know, so so I I, I think um, charities. I think you know a very big uh, opportunity is actually digitizing the world right. and helping a lot of organizations to digitize themselves, right? You know, and and I always look at technology advancement, and every time you have uh, 3G and 4G, a, a new video platform, the point industry is actually the first to innovate. And the last one is actually charities and education, right? So if there's anything I can do right now, I would actually want to help charities and education institutions to digitize now, Are themselves. your parents alive? Yeah. And are they proud of you, or they tell you how <laughs> they raised you, and if they responsible for all your success, they tell you that, or? Should be pretty happy. They are happy, <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay. So if I had some, Hopefully. Extra, if I had some extra money, um, and I said I can only buy one stock in China, I'm either gonna buy Alibaba, Tencent, or Baidu. What <laughs> stock should I buy? <laughs> Is which, I mean, do you think you have the best future project, projection of You're rich enough to buy three. Yeah, I'm looking can, for a good yeah. tip. 
Uh, well, you don't need more money, David. Uh, right? <laughs> always have more money. Okay, so your, your potential, I assume you would say, is a better investment. Well, we try to do your best for you. And uh, is your stock a still a good investment? <coughs> this very high valuation yeah. that you won't say. It's not you can't buy it, but on a if private. If you're a long-term yeah. investor, I would advise you to. Okay, and um, when is your company going public? By the way. We don't have a specific timetable. Oh, you don't ever want to go public? No. Okay. Yeah. So um, if Google went public in a very unique way, yes, it kind 2004. of used, very unique way. The stock went public at about eighty-five dollars a That's share. Correct. So today it's at uh, more than two thousand. More than two thousand. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I guess you have no regrets about going public, right? <laughs> we have no. <laughs> we certainly have no regrets, and we recommend so it. Now you are involved a bit now in philanthropy. You've been involved before, but uh, how do you decide what to do as a philanthropist with your money? Uh, you're, you're involved in technology things or other kinds of things. What is it well, you're going to do? For me personally, we've, we've given away money for environmental causes for a long time. But for me personally, I was interested in the application of artificial intelligence to science. So we've been doing a great deal of money there. And there are many, many hardcore science problems that are now solvable that were not solvable before in physics, chemistry, climate science, etc. cetera. Uh, the newest idea, which I'm very proud of, is we decided to focus on uh, the next generation of talent. And we announced that we we're going to contribute a billion dollars over a lifetime to searching for the next generation of incredibly smart people. Uh, this is sort of the future Einstein. So we did a partnership with Rhodes, the, the Rhodes Trust, which are the Rhodes Scholars, to help them. They will help select the people, and they will help get them into global universities, help them with their careers, that kind of thing. So do you think that having fancy degrees is important, or just a desire to work hard and not having fancy degrees is important. When you're looking at young entrepreneurs, do you care whether they have a degree or they don't have a degree? Well, when you talk to somebody, uh, the, the great thing about the, the, uh, an advanced degree from a, a top university is the selection has already been done for you, right? All of the various winnowing and so forth. You know they can show up, you know they're creative, you know that they're hardworking. Uh, there are exceptions, you, so you quoted them. But if you look longitudinally at incomes, a college degree, and in particular an advanced degree in technical subjects, is very important for wealth creation, personal, uh, pro uh, professional advancement, so forth and so on. So uh, if you were to put your finger on the one thing that made Google the search engine that conquered the world in some respects, what would you say it was? It was the CEO? Uh, no, certainly not. Was the, it, um, what would you the, say the, it was? The, the founders set, a, the founders set a, a, a culture of excellence with respect to engineering. And the search engine moved very, very quickly, right, to get just better and better and better. And people could sense it was better. And if we look at these two companies, both Didi, Didi and Tencent, each of them moved very, very quickly into these markets. And the story that's not told, that has to be repeated, is the window to get into a market is very narrow. Listen to her story of how quickly she had to respond to the challenge from Uber, right, and her description of how they worked. And the Chinese folks work really, really hard, 996 and all right. that kind of stuff. So part of the outcome is luck, strength, timing, but also a discipline and being lucky at the right time. Now, do you think women have as good a chance to rise up in technology companies as men in China? Sure, absolutely. And you, therefore, you go out of your way to hire women, or you don't go out of your way because they're, <coughs> they're equally talented and you're just going to get the cross-section yeah. anyway? I think, first of all, women need to, um, you know, get rid of the glass ceiling concept. And secondly, as a corporation, we should create a more friendly environment for women. Uh, for example, you know, a lot of them, when they give birth, you know, we create a you know, work from home environment for them. And at DD, we actually initiated a DD Women's Network a few years ago, actually uh, four years ago, just to encourage women to work from home. Actually, one technology which I would really look forward to is to invest in AR or VR. I think Tencent should totally do that. So that you know you can you, know, you can replicate this atmosphere at home. You can have the full experience at home. And this is emotional, <coughs> right? Like the Bloomberg form is emotional, right? right? If we can replicate this at home, right, it empowers all the women and I think it solves all the problems we talked about at this forum, right? People get understanding, you know, the New Yorker sees what Beijinger is experiencing, right? We, we understand right. what David's talking about. So um, I think, you know, when t technologies, you know, can really empower a lot of things, including women, you know, right. women's but career. In yeah. the end, who are more responsible workers, women or men? I assume it's... <laughs> 
Well, you asked my bias view? Yes. Well, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So um, the China dispute with the United States on trade, you're probably familiar with it, has it affected you in any way, or do you really care whether it's resolved in the near term, or it won't affect you one way or the other? Well, it hasn't affected us per se, but then, you know, it's actually kind of dangerous, right? You know, the, the way it is going, right? You know, and, and if there is really going to be additional sanction or, or you know, the, the two countries actually go further apart, because I, I think, you know, if you look at uh, technology advancement, right, you know, what we're talking about is innovation, right? right. You know, innovation really happens when people collaborate. Right? Even if you look at China, the, the tech industry, right, you know, it, it's really uh, built upon you know, a lot of grassroots uh, uh, entrepreneurs right, who know about the market. But at the same time, right, there, there are a lot of engineers and entrepreneurs who have had experience in the States and come back, and the capital which is pro, you know, funding this growth, right? You know, it's like your, your very company, right? You know, actually, sort of, you know, a lot of them are associated with the states, bringing in experience, right? So this kind of uh, biodiversity is actually very, very important so for innovation. When, when you're looking to hire somebody, you're looking to hire somebody who's really, really smart, really, really hardworking, really, really nice, really, really well-dressed. What are your big things? <laughs> All of the above without the well-dressed. No well-dressed. <laughs> yeah. And nobody is allowed to wear a tie at your company? I well, they can wear ties, right? But then usually nobody we know does. that they just joined the company. Okay, so nobody wears a tie. <laughs> so the U.S.-China trade agreement or not agreement yet, does, that, does it affect you one way or the other? Do you care? Not really, not really. It doesn't affect you. Yeah, it doesn't affect and us. Eric, uh, do you have any sense whether there's going to be an agreement uh, between the U.S. and China? Um, I don't, and I don't think any of us know. I think it's important that it be resolved. Um, this this, this process that we seem to be going through of decoupling China and the United States is dangerous at many, many levels. Uh, an example is that in the United States, and our report from the AI Commission pointed this out, um, the United States is critically dependent upon Chinese graduate students, Chinese undergraduates, but in particular Chinese graduate students who are exceptional, and they're in the American system and they're advancing American research. So as you begin to cut those limits, it can hurt the United States, as well as obviously China. So if somebody's sitting here and they say, you're a very smart technology person, I'd like to follow your lead, where would you have people invest some of their money and what areas would you think are the most attractive in the next five or 10 years in a technology? Well, in general, the biological revolution is going to be profound, right? We've gotten to the point where the squishy stuff, the, the hardcore biology, can quickly be translated into uh, analytical things, digits. And then huge insights come out, whether it's in genetics or in treatments and so forth and so on. Uh, in many cases, the payback for that is very long, however. Much shorter is the payback in medical fields. So for example, hospital services, doctor services, and so forth. So if I had one area to start, I'd start in healthcare, where the healthcare has a technological component where the technology is improving very quickly. The healthcare needs of the world are massive. Right? All of these countries have huge problems with respect to dealing with an, uh, an aging generation and the health pr problems. It's a huge market. So if you were talking to students you teach at Stanford from time to time, uh, what would you tell students about the most important thing they should know about innovation and what brings innovation uh, about? Well, ultimately, this is all about entrepreneurs, right? And, and th these entrepreneurs are good examples of what it takes. And they're, they're, they're skilled, and they're lucky, and they're clever, and they move it quickly. You need to teach people that to right. entrepreneurs need to be identified, protected, and trained. You all have uh, many things in common. You're very smart, very talented, very successful. But the key, the secret is this. Each of your companies has two syllables. So I got it right. <laughs> and sent. DD and Google. So that's what is the unifying thing. Have a company with Hello two syllables, too, right? right? And so Carlisle. Insightful. So <laughs> Carlisle as well. So if you have two syllables in your company, you're going to make a lot of money. That's the key thing that everybody should remember. I want to thank you. We're out of time. Thank you very much for a conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you.